Welcome everyone. I'm Trudy Senevaratna, um, the Registrar of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So before we start today's webinar, just a few housekeeping rules for um, the attendees. Um, please can you use the Q&A box to add your questions for our speakers, uh, use the chat box for comments. After the session, you'll be sent details of how to watch uh, a recording of today's webinar. Uh, there'll be certificates of attendance uh, that will be emailed to you next week. Uh, and finally, please fill in our feedback survey. Uh, we really, really do want to hear about your experience today. So moving on to today's webinar, which is about uh, uh, attending a CCQI peer review, uh, and we've called it What's In It For You. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be taking part and both sharing and saying a few words uh, in the webinar. Um, we have uh, the wonderful Peter Thompson, who's our Senior Associate Director for the College uh, Centre for Quality Improvement with us. Uh, and I'm also very grateful for uh, to Dr. Vishal Kamath, who's a consultant for neuropsychiatry services at St. Andrews. Uh, I'll introduce you a little bit more later on who's, who's joining us for uh, the webinar. Um, so with the CCQI, the College Centre for Quality Improvement is a department of the college that works with multidisciplinary teams in mental health services helping them to measure and improve the quality of care that they offer. So it's really very important. One of the CCQI's main activities is running quality networks uh, and accreditation programmes right across the, the UK and, uh, uh, and hopefully beyond and internationally is one of uh, the latest thinking. Um, the first was actually established 20 years ago in 2001. Today, there are currently a staggering 27 networks across a range of mental health services and over 1,550 services around the UK that participate. As well as the networks offering an opportunity to have your own service reviewed, there is an opportunity to review other services as a peer reviewer uh, and learn about other services. Today's webinar will hopefully give you an overview of the work of the networks how participation could benefit your service, and also how being a reviewer can help with your own professional development. So to begin with, uh, please may I invite Peter, so Peter Thompson, who has been uh, with the CCQI for a very long time. Um, Peter is our Senior Associate Director for the College Centre for Quality Improvement. Thank you, Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Trudy. I'll just share my screen. Um, great. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as Trudy said, I'm Peter and I'm the Senior Associate Director of the College Centre for Quality Improvement. And today I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about the work that we do, particularly in relation to the networks and say a bit about what the opportunities are for people who would be interested in becoming a reviewer for us. Um, as Trudy mentioned, the CCQI is a department of the college that works with mental health services and supports clinicians to help them make improvements to the care that they deliver. And we do that through focusing on two main areas of work. One is the quality networks and accreditation programmes that we're going to particularly focus on today. But we also run national clinical audits. At the moment, we're running two audits focusing on psychosis and dementia that are funded by NHS England and also the Welsh Government. And this slide just gives you a few statistics about the department at a glance. Um, all mental health trusts in England take part in the work of the department. And as part of our strategic plan, we're growing in the devolved nations as well. So I think in the networks, over 10% of our members now are in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, as Trudy also mentioned, we've got 27 quality network and accreditation programmes. And across those 27 networks, each network is focused on a different specialism within mental health. And across those networks, we work with 1,550 mental health services around the UK. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the work that we do, back in 2019, we visited 681 mental health services around the country to help them look at the quality of the care that they offer. 
all the work that we do is delivered in collaboration with patients and carers. So we work with about 100 patient and carer representatives who are involved in all elements of the work, be it developing standards, developing data collection tools, but also attending visits to services to review the quality of care and also sitting on committees that might decide whether services can become accredited by the college or not. And the other big part of our work is about creating networking opportunities and bringing clinicians together and creating opportunities for them to share learning and to share best practice with each other. And last year in 2020, uh, we held nearly 100 conferences, webinars and training days that were attended by over 13,000 people. So what is it that the quality networks and accreditation programs do to support services to improve? Um, the first thing that we do is that we set standards and those standards describe what a good service looks like. And we develop those standards in collaboration with people who actually work on the front line delivering services, but also by looking at best practice guidance and also by getting feedback from patient and carer representatives as well. Once those standards are set, we measure how well services are performing against the standards using a process of self and peer review. Um, we also provide forums for bringing people together and a lot of the networks are in many respects clinical communities really where people can kind of make relationships and form links with people who do similar jobs to them but in other services around the country and obviously that's a great way of sh sharing new practice, sharing new ideas and learning from each other. And finally we support improvements so we don't just review a service and say you know that's, that's something you're not doing very well. We also think about how we can support services to make improvements to address those areas. So for example, if we picked up that a lot of services were struggling with a similar issue, we might then put in place a training day or an intervention to support them to make that improvement in the longer term. As I mentioned, we've got 27 networks and they cover a wide range of specialisms within mental health services. I won't read all of these out from the slides, but the next two slides just list some of the areas of mental health that we have networks based in. Um, the first network was set up in 2001, working with child and adolescent inpatient services. And since then, we've continued to launch, launch one or two new networks every year to add to the list using a very similar methodology, but just applying it to different service types. Um, each service that participates in the work of the CCQI pays a subscription fee to the college and that's how the work of the networks is funded. This second slide just shows a few more of the specialisms that we work within and down at the bottom there you'll see our most recently launched network um, which looks at the work of serious incident review teams in trusts and health boards. But you can see the full list of all the networks on our website and I think we'll be giving links in the chat if you want to go in and have a look at any of those in more detail. This is the review process that the quality network and accreditation programs follow. So once we've set those standards, services that participate go into self-review phase. And that's really an opportunity for them to reflect on their own practice and to score themselves against the standards and think about how they think they're performing. And as part of that, they may also collect evidence to demonstrate how they're meeting those standards. Once that self-review is completed, we then send in a team of clinicians for a peer review visit. And they're people who work in similar services but in other services around the country. Um, and often that review team will also include a patient or a carer representative. That review team um, look, spend some time at the service, meeting with patients, carers, staff, and give feedback about what the service is doing well, how the service could improve, and then any ideas about how the service might go about making those improvements. That all goes into a local report after the day. Um, and that local report is a really powerful tool for the service to use, possibly to advocate for more funding locally, but also as an action planning guide to help them to make steps towards making those improvements over the coming year. We also, for each of the networks, run an annual forum, which is obviously another great way for people to come together and share learning and best practice. And we also produce an aggregated report where we pull together all the data we've collected across the network. And that obviously enables us to look at trends nationally, but also gives individual services the chance to benchmark themselves against similar services. And it's an ongoing process. So our first network launched 20 years ago. And for some services that have been part of that process, they're going through their 20th year of involvement. This slide just gives a little bit more information about what's involved on a review day. Um, we have a tour of the environment. That's obviously particularly important for inpatient services, but we have a look around the spaces that are used by patients, used by clinicians, um, and the sections of the standards that relate to environmental things. We also have a number of meetings with staff, both frontline and senior, and patients and carers. And essentially we collect feedback from those three groups um, and triangulate that feedback to make decisions about whether standards are met or not met. 
a big part of the day focuses on action planning and where there are unmet standards, the review team supports the services to think about how they might go about making those improvements. And obviously because they're peers, because they work in similar services, they can share their own ideas of what they've done locally to help the service to meet the standard. We look at documentation as well. And at the end of the day, there's a feedback session where the team can let the service know what they've been impressed by, what they think the challenges are, and then how they go about meeting some of those challenges. So obviously um, we're very reliant on reviewers to run that process and our peer reviewers, our clinician reviewers and our patient and care reviewers play a really important role in the work of the department. Um, there are many benefits to being a reviewer and I think hopefully Trudy and Vichelle are gonna to touch on some of those in their talks, but um, it's obviously an opportunity to visit another service and see a different way of working and how another service delivers um, the care that they offer. It's usually a one day commitment, some of our visits are two or three days that's usually only in forensic services but otherwise for all of the networks that we run it's only a one day commitment to visit a service and a lot of the work in terms of preparation and things that are done afterwards um, is done by a team based at the college so it's normally all the work it can be done within that one day and um, you'll be part of a multidisciplinary team of clinicians and also there'll usually be a patient or carer representative with you and usually also a member of college staff um, and it's a really great opportunity to share your own good practice, but to also learn from others. And we often hear of reviewers who went to visit a service, saw them that something that was really good, and they took it back to their own service and implemented it and found that they could make an improvement locally as well. Um, and the other great thing about being a reviewer is that it's a really good opportunity for CPD and revalidation. So subject to peer approval, you can gain CPD appoint points for being a reviewer for the CCQI, but also you may be able to use your experiences of being a peer reviewer to complete the quality improvement section of the revalidation process as well. In terms of the benefits for a service going through the process, obviously it's that great opportunity to review yourself against nationally agreed standards and benchmark yourself and see how you're performing against other similar services. Um, it's also really that opportunity to be part of a network of professionals who do the same job as you, but in other parts of the country um, to share learning and innovative practice. And I know from my own experience of working in the department, sometimes um, services before there was a network in that area didn't really get an opportunity to talk to people who did the same job as them elsewhere. So there was a lot of reinventing the wheel and hopefully these networks provide a way to share learning in a better way. Um, accreditation services that can demonstrate that they're meeting enough of the standards through the review process can become accredited by the college and obviously accreditation is a really great way to demonstrate the quality of your service, both to people who fund it, but also to patients and carers who are accessing it. And finally, as I mentioned, we run a lot of free events um, for members throughout the year. Um, and this, as a member, you get free access to all of those events and also some training days as well. I'd imagine many of you are thinking with all the references to visits and traveling around the country, you must be wondering how COVID has impacted on the work of the department. Um, and initially it was pretty significantly impacted. Back in March, we had to make the really difficult decision to cancel nearly 300 reviews that we had planned around the country. Um, but since then we've done a lot of work to move all of the review activity online. Um, and it seems to be working really well, actually. Um, we've had positive feedback, both from services and reviewers who are participating. And already we've completed over 150 online reviews of services around the country. And I suppose there are, I guess, unintended benefits of doing them online as well. Obviously, reviewer travel is dramatically reduced if you can review a service from your own house. Um, and also, obviously, we've had to cancel a lot of face to face events. But what we have found is that online events have actually proved to be really popular. So we've held nearly 100 events over the last year. Initially, they were very focused on supporting services to think about how to respond to COVID. But as time's gone on, we've continued with some of the usual events that we had planned. Um, and nearly 13,000 people have joined one of our events over the last year, which is actually nearly three times as many as joined in 2019. So the move to online has been really successful in that respect. Um, and I just wanted to finish before handing back to Trudy, just to highlight the impact of the work of the networks and to really kind of sell why it's a really useful, beneficial experience to be a reviewer. Um, we have an accreditation network that works with liaison services called PLAN, the Psychiatric Liaison Accreditation Network, which we established just over 10 years ago. And there's about 70 liaison services around the country that participate in that network. In 2017, the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death 
um, did a report called Treat As One, and it looked at the gap between mental and physical health care in general hospitals. And they looked particularly at the quality of liaison psychiatry services um, and looked at the levels of good practice in those teams. And what they found was that the best practice was delivered by liaison teams that had been accredited through the plan process. The second best was where there was a liaison team, but they weren't accredited. And the um, the worst practice was in those areas that unfortunately didn't have a liaison team. But there was a clear difference between liaison teams that had been accredited and hadn't been accredited in terms of the quality of the care that they offered, um, which really, I guess, speaks to the impact that PLAN has had for those teams in driving up quality locally. Um, that's it from me. I'll hand back to Trudy now, but that's my email address if anyone wants to get in touch with me. As I mentioned, the college website is a really good resource to find out more about the networks and to see more about the standards that we set. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter. Our um, Twitter handle is rcpsychccqi, which is a great way of keeping up to date with opportunities to get involved in our work. Um, but I'll hand you back to Trudy now. Thank you very much. That's brilliant, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's just great to hear and, and just hearing, you know, the 27 networks and all those services. Uh, and I can't begin to tell you and I'll, con I'll continue to say through through the webinar, um, that sort of family feeling across all the networks, certainly in the perinatal quality network, which I know intimately, uh, and a way of sharing that information. But hopefully we'll have some more questions about all of this later, Peter. Thank you so much. Um, and moving on, we um, thank you, Vishal. So we have Dr. Vishal Kamath, who is a consultant for neuropsychiatry services at St. Andrews. And she's the chair of the uh, Quality Network for Older Adults Mental Health Services Advisory Group. And she has uh, spent years developing and helping to develop the new quality standards for that network, along with all her colleagues. Uh, she works both in the NHS and in the independent sector. So thank you, Vishal. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Trudy. Um, I just want to check that my you can see my slides. I just want to make Not sure yet. That, sorry, let me make sure that we can see them. Are you able to see them now? Hasn't come up yet. Let's try this one and see if it works. Oh, not sure what's happening. Let me just. But, uh, yeah, we can see them. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, Trudy. And um, I think I have probably the easiest job this afternoon in talking about what I've got out of being a reviewer, being part of a quality network, and to help um, some of you think about how you can benefit from it yourselves um, in terms of expanding your own network in terms of opportunities for CPD um, to support your own revalidation and really think about how you're able to support the services that you work in um, to be able to deliver absolute high quality services for the patients that you look after. To start off with, um, I wanted to check how many of you have our currently reviewers so I'm going to ask Catherine to put up a um, to put up a a, a a polling station so we can have uh, so we can have a look to see how many people currently um, as consultants um, are currently peer reviewers or belong to a network so Catherine are you able to help me with that Yep, that's on screen now and people are voting right now. Excellent. So we want to see how we're able to influence that and hopefully some of that will change as we get to the end of the meeting. Okay, I think most people have had a chance to vote now. So we'll move on and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, we'll move to the next question. So how many of you have actually thought about it, but then thought that it might just be a little bit too much work or more work than it's worth, or just in the current um, climate where each of us is extremely pressured with several competing demands, that it's just not the right time for you? 
So if you let us know how many of you have actually had a think about it um, and, and have thought about it and thought maybe a bit later, just not yet at the moment. So if you can put your answers up, we'll get a better idea of where people are. Okay. Thank you all very much for that. Again, we'll come back to those questions um, at the end. So for me, working and being part of a network um, started with me supporting my own service or thinking about within the service that I worked in at the time, which was a complex dementia service, thinking about how I supported them, how I familiarized myself with um, the standards, how I thought about making the argument or rationale to um, the managers within the organization that I worked with about the value of belonging to a network and um, the value of being accredited. Um, what I've learned is that the actual accreditation is probably what we've benefited least from. What I've benefited as an individual and my colleagues within the service, be it nursing colleagues or other consultant psychiatrists, is actually uh, the benefits or the wider benefits of belonging to the quality network. Um, my experience, so I started off by looking at what, uh, how, how I would get my own service accredited. Then as I became more involved and be became a little bit more acquainted with individuals within that network, um, I then started, um, I, then, I, I then became part of the advisory group um, and then went on to chair it and then have been involved in reviewing the new updated standards that were published um, last year. So for me, it has been a journey and one that I really think that I've benefited from myself. So in terms of the wider benefits, we know that promoting quality improvement um, as clinicians and um, for our patients and within services that we work in is to make sure that they're safer, they're more effective. So we are abiding by evidence-based practice. We're using that we're much more patient-centered, we're trying to ensure that we make sure that there is strong, there is a strong patient voice with um, the values of co-production and the essence of co-produced co patient-led care um, central to what we do. Um, other benefits of quality improvement is that we can work much more efficiently, um, which is definitely of value in the current climate and that we're able to deliver services that are equitable, both in terms of um, supporting our staff and the patients that we look after. So th those are the overall, uh, just a flavor of some of the overall benefits of quality improvement. But as a psychiatrist, I think there are many more benefits of being a peer reviewer that sometimes we don't think about or consider at the outset. And it's certainly something that I didn't, I, I didn't think that I would um, gain being part, not only being a reviewer, but being part of the network and um, being part of a review process, um, which is just not a day's work. Um, it is certainly, certainly much more beneficial than I had anticipated. So what I hadn't realized were the varied opportunities for CPD. Um, and if you do belong to a member service, they're free. So with study budgets and all of those things and the pressures associated with those sorts of things, it is the availability of high quality CPD. And I've been extremely fortunate. I've had the opportunity to attend some excellent CPD sessions, um, which have been engaging, interactive, and from which I have learned so, so much. So the opportunities for CPD are, um, are several and varied. Um, and um, like, like I said, the, the, they have the added benefit of being free, a lot of them, for member services. Um, quality improvement is something that many of you 
will be asked to engage in within the services that you work in. But understanding how to do that um, can sometimes be difficult. Understanding of how you can contribute to that. So sort of you know, understanding the essence of what it is, but then translating that into the actual doing can be quite difficult. Um, being part of a peer review will help you to formulate some of that understanding for yourself and think about quality improvement activities. You also get the opportunity um, to visit other services, either remotely now due to COVID or in the past, um, visit them in person to understand some of the quality improvement activities that they undertake. Um, and a lot of them will have had similar challenges um, that you face in your day-to-day -day practice yourself. And that a lot of them will have devised solutions that are ready-made. They will have gone through the process of exploring and investigating the problem and thinking about how they address them. And some of those solutions are very easily, um, e it's very easy for you to replicate in your own service. So the opportunity for learning, the, the opportunity for sharing how different people have overcome those challenges in different area is, is, is quite immense. I mean, what I can say from my own experience, having been a peer reviewer, is that I have on several occasions um, nicked bits of good practice and um, things that people have done and employed them in my own service um, to, to extremely good effect. It's helped me to find solutions where in some cases you actually think that there may be no solution. Um, it's not just the practice, but the ability to affect change. So what you learn from being a peer reviewer from other members of the network are how they've managed to navigate through the operational management structure, some of the financial constraints, what are the arguments they've, they've been able to put forward to be able to deliver those practices and service developments within their own service, So, and which can be quite invaluable. So sharing some of those tricks of the trade, sharing how people have managed to be success, successful in those areas um, is actually extended learning beyond actual practice itself. Um, the opportunity to meet other people. So if you do decide to become a peer reviewer, um, you will have the opportunity to, you, you do have to do the peer review training. So you will meet individuals um, from services across the country. Um, there are several opportunities through reflective practice groups, the annual forums, which are extremely beneficial. Um, and you will get the opportunity to be able to speak to other people. And it can be quite supportive, particularly um, over the last year where there have been significant challenge. Um, and I will talk a little bit later about how within older adult services, how being a reviewer and part of the network has enabled us to provide support to each other at a time of extreme challenge. Um, all of us endeavor to make sure we are as up to date with nationally agreed evidence-based standards. What the um, network does and being a reviewer enables you to do is to keep ahead and to, to, to assimilate what those new standards are um, one of the things that you, you have the benefit of doing is reviewing the quality standards, becoming quite familiar with it as you go through the review process. Um, and all of those are based on nationally agreed, nationally agreed evidence-based standards, which you become extremely familiar with, um, which you can then adopt in your own practice um, without having to review a huge amount of literature and things like that yourself um, on an ongoing basis. The opportunities for CPD um, within that will offer you um, updates in terms of recent changes in practice or anything around standards, um, evidence-based standards that may have evolved or may be uh, practice changing. One of the other 
key learning is about how you understand how other services are resourced um, and how they use their resources as effectively as possible. It's not directly related to the core quality standards themselves um, or sort of CPD, but how they're able to run effectively, how they're able to deliver high quality services um, with constrained resource or any resource pressures that they may be experiencing, um, either due to staffing challenges, either due to you know, reduction in financial investment or growing demand, is something that um, I have found quite useful. I've learned from some of my other colleagues and from other members of the network about how to be able to make cases for escalation to senior management for um, looking at how we can develop and evolve our services a little bit better as a result of the experience that I've had um, through being both a reviewer and being part of a uh, part of the network. In terms of my experience from an older adult service perspective, um, we I have had the opportunity to belong to the, um, attend the annual forum, um, which um, has, was extremely beneficial. I've done that for the last few years. And um, my first annual forum that I attended was the protagonist for me to think about how, how I would like to become more involved. Um, the opportunity to share practice, to network with other people was extremely beneficial. Um, it helped me to understand how I can acquire a little bit more knowledge, use my CPD from the um, activities that are available so that uh, by the time I got to my own appraisal and then uh, in subsequent uh, revalidation, um, I was able to have, uh, I, I was able to have had without much effort acquired quite a substantial amount of quality improvement activities and CPD activities. Older adult services have always been the poorer cousin, so they've needed strong advocates, which the um, old age quality network provides. Um, it helps those uh, that work within old adult services across the country to be able to come together as a strong collaborative shared voice um, of what should be good practice and help to advocate for that, particularly um, over the last year. So a lot of you will have seen lots of evolving standards, guidance around care, uh, particularly related to COVID and the impact on mental health services. Um, most of them were for adults. There, were, there was very, very little advice and um, clear uh, document, documented guidance for old age or older adults. The peer network and the forum helped us to be able to establish that together. It provided not only um, an opportunity to be able to test out our views and what we were doing in our services together, it helped us to share practice in a way that gave us the confidence to be able to implement those sorts of things in our own services. It also was invaluable in terms of providing the opportunity to reflect, to review, and do a little bit of repair together. Um, so for me as a psychiatrist, I have benefited quite significantly from not only um, being part of a service that is part of the network, but being a peer reviewer myself has enabled me to think a little bit more about what good looks like outside of my own service, um, have the opportunity to discuss some of the challenges that uh, I have faced or, and my colleagues within the service that I work in have faced on a day-to-day -day basis, but also provided us with um, solutions that others have tried, which is extremely beneficial. Um, I think that the, I can't, I cannot um, 
I cannot emphasize how important the additional benefits of things like the opportunity to get involved in various quality improvement activities as a reviewer contribute to your um, CPD and the supporting activities that you're required to do for your appraisal. Being that advocate for your own service within the organizations that you work with, so thinking, having the thinking about how you provide rationales for um, evolving service, further investment and things like that is definitely something that I have been able to use within the services that I've worked in. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I am going to ask Trudy to, uh, sorry, not so I'm going to ask Catherine to put up the, um, the final uh, slide. To, to put. So what I want to ask each of you is, I'm not sure if I've been able to help you um, to think about whether you would like to become a reviewer or understand some of the benefits of uh, being a reviewer yourself. Um, so if I could ask you each to put in your yes or no. So if you haven't been a reviewer, I want to see whether we've had any, uh, whether we've been able to convince you at all of some of the benefits that um, you can derive yourself. So um, I'm going to ask each of you, so how many of you would now consider being a peer reviewer more seriously than you'd done previously? Sorry, Catherine, I can't see the... It's up there, people uh, are voting. Um, at the beginning, only 25% had been a peer reviewer or completed a peer review. And we now have, great, we have now 84% saying they would definitely consider <laughs> becoming a peer reviewer. Um, and I've, I have been extremely genuine in sharing my own experience um, because I think that, uh, you know, that I, I cannot overstate some of the benefits. I'm hoping that those of you that are now considering it more seriously will uh, follow the information that was set out, uh, sent on the information box and that Peter talked about and think about how you can sign up um, to the network yourself and become a peer reviewer yourself. I will, within the slides, uh, the last slide does have my email address and things like that, which Catherine will share post the webinar. But if anybody um, has any questions or anything they'd like to ask me, uh, please feel free to email me directly. And um, with Trudy, we'll take some questions together at the end. Thank you very much. That's brilliant, Vishal. <coughs> What a fantastic increase in the poll. I think we need to have you doing this much more often. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we'll have some, uh, we will have time for questions at the end as well. Um, so with that, let me just pop my slides up. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I won't take um, all the time because I do want some time for questions at the end. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled, as I said, to be part of um, uh, you know a CCQI process. And I have to say, I've written a couple of things down, Vishal, as you were speaking, uh, which is actually being part of the quality network uh, for uh, perinatal services in my sort of clinical job has been one of the best things I have to say I've done as a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, uh, and to me, it's the gift that has kept giving. Uh, and hopefully I will sort of, whilst I want to talk you through the, the perinatal quality network story in the, in the short time that we have. Uh, and it truly has been fantastic in that sense of family, that sense of belonging, that sense of sharing, that sense of really driving up quality year on year, which is what we all want to do. And you know, why, why should you as psychiatrists and why should you encourage your uh, colleagues and teams to, to take part in this? Uh, uh, I mean, the, pro so the whole process is absolutely dependent on having uh, both psychiatrists and colleagues from within multidisciplinary teams engaging with this. And of course, 
you know, there's always a turnover of colleagues over time. Uh, but I can't emphasize how important the uh, role of the psychiatrist is, as well as other colleagues within this. So why do we do this? So, of course, you know, we do this for the benefit of our patients, don't we? Um, and what the network has done year on year for all the years that uh, this network has existed, is it has driven up the quality of what we're doing for our mothers and babies and fathers and families. And it really genuinely has. So. Uh, between the mother and baby units and the community services standards have just gone up and up and up uh, over all these years uh, it's fantastic that there are you know part of the process includes um, a very detailed feedback from um, patient service users carers as part of this as well as referrers and and the uh, the team feedback uh, and it's a really genuine and honest process in a way i think actually that uh, other processes like the CQC don't quite capture. This is very tailored you know, towards a service that you're a part of uh, and the standards and the advisory board that you've heard about from Vishal just now, depending on the network, is, is very tailored to the services that we're looking after. So it's a genuine, you know, it's an absolute quality uh, driver for the people that we uh, most care about within our services. So that's why we fundamentally uh, are doing this. Um, but of course, um, you know, the, the next reason is that the sense of family and belonging and doing it together, uh, you know, recruiting new staff as, a part, as part of the peer review process. And here we've got a number of nursery nurses in uh, the mother and baby unit team at Bethlehem, as well as uh, nurses and doctors. Many of the nursery nurses actually were employed as a result of a, 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 an accredited a peer review process with, where we were able to increase our nursing nursery nurse numbers so really important that they can it can be pivotal drivers to to change within uh, services uh, and then for us as doctors you know all these things that you've heard uh, both peter and vishal beautifully talk about uh, how meaningful is it for us as doctors and psychiatrists and i can say that for me um uh, since the quality network had started i think every single year on my appraisal documentation the, the networks have featured heavily as part of my knowledge section my um, safety and quality section my um, uh, research i guess with the audits uh, that can feed into research and teaching and training it feels you know it, in, in a very positive way it feeds into that uh, appraisal and revalidation process, which is a really helpful way. And actually, when you get to know colleagues around the country, they can also feed into an individual 360 multi-source process. And, uh, you know, we talk about quality improvement all the time, don't we? But this feels like a really uh, solid uh, and effective way of uh, genuinely driving up that quality across services. It also makes it really interesting. So, so the perinatal story. So let me tell you a, a very quick story about the perinatal story. So before the quality network, we used to have something called the traveling circuses. There was a northern traveling circus for the northern part of the UK and a southern traveling circus. And we used to go around, someone would organize, a local team would organize it, would go and visit each other's services, have a look at the mother and baby unit, uh, and we'd have some lectures and talks. Uh, and it was fantastic. It was a really lovely... Uh, way of uh, learning from each other. But when we then moved on to a quality network process, and I'm, you know, we are so indebted uh, to everybody that was involved, including people like Peter that was, uh, was there right at the start, but Margaret Oates, who very much drove this uh, from its inception. And so there was a gestational period of a couple of years when all the standards were developed. And then in 2007, the first inpatient review started to happen. So a, a big thank you to Margaret particularly. Um, and as I said, it has made an enormous difference to services year, year on year as we've gone forward. Um, and I think I've said, said all of this, that actually since those first reviews in 2007 for the inpatient mother and baby units, we then developed a community framework uh, which started in 2013 um, and um, all the MBUs are accredited and we're working towards, uh, or at least I think they're all, yes, they are all accredited. Harriet, you'll have to correct me later if they're not. And many of the community services starting to be accredited as well. Um, 
and for the multidisciplinary team to learn from each other. Um, you know, it is, a, it is work uh, as a psychiatrist to be working with your team to get the uh, peer review and accreditation process uh, ready, but it's, it's very, very valuable to do that and then to go through the process of making sure that we reach uh, the, the correct standard. So in 2020, so last year we had, because if you recall, uh, perinatal services had a big injection of cash uh, to expand uh, the number of inpatient units by four uh, around 26, uh, 2016 and 17 as part of the uh, uh, five year forward view. Um, so we've, we're now, we've now been accrediting all of those services. Uh, most of the, as you've heard from Peter, those had to be mostly virtual through last year. Um, but one, one unit still was a, uh, awarded accreditation last year, never, nevertheless. So we're on cycle 13 of these and uh, our unit has just had its 13th accreditation um, review, uh, which as I said, was hard work to, to, to make sure we, we, we did everything that we needed to do, but actually the team really pulled together and it was great that we had colleagues from uh, Scotland uh, joining the peer review, whereas previously uh, I, I remember traveling up to the mother and baby unit in uh, more places like Morpeth in the northeast and in, into the Glasgow unit and they'd be day trips to get up there and back, but actually um, doing a virtual review made that so much more pos possible and you know I'm hoping that actually as we go forward from the pandemic doing virtual reviews will really make it much more possible for everyone to engage in this process. So we've uh, each network and these are the standards that we have for the inpatient service as you see that uh, there are standards around estates and environments to staffing to the, the care and treatment confidentiality uh, rights and consent, audit and policy discharge. So really quite detailed sets of standards that we go through. Um, what, one of the areas that we uh, improved as a result of one of the reviews was actually developing a nursery. And that was really great to have a review team look at what we had. And uh, we were all starting to get rather envious that uh, many of the other uh, newer units uh, had really nice nursery areas and nurseries, and we were able to invest and uh, actually, you know, lean on our managers to say, actually, we'd like uh, uh, the quality of our own unit to be uh, much higher. And so we were able to do that and develop uh, a newer nursery area as well as a, a sensory room on the ward. And this was some of the data from 2017. Uh, just, just Peter mentioned that we're able to track, we can pull all the units from around the country, all the services and monitor those over time. And that's really, really helpful in teasing out a, a national picture, but also a, a team's own data. And this is just an example of uh, inpatient wards where you know, we, we can look at some of the lowest scoring criterion. So for example, pushing up uh, disciplines like social work on a ward or nursery nurses, or every patient having an ensuite bathroom is particularly low. Uh, that's an area our units is still, you know, we, we don't have that still. Um, and other areas, for example, not having adequate psychological uh, therapies or psychologists on a ward. Um, so, you know, the, these criteria it can help to, or, or the process of this can help to, to drive up getting some of those additional uh, staff. So the standards get revised over time. Um, and that's really helpful because we can push for standards to go up to a, a type one or an essential standard. So now every mother and baby unit, for example, has to have a psychologist and it has to have an occupational therapist, whereas previously it didn't. Moving on to the community standards, you see again, a similar list of standards from the referral process through to uh, care and treatment and, and, and so on. Um, back in 2017, we had 27 services around the country. Uh, and at the time, um, you know, some of the lowest scoring were, for example, not having uh, non-consultant psychiatrists. Again, social work input was poor, OT input was poor. Um, and that's a little bit more of, of that. Um, but what we were able to do over the next few years, and again, this was a time when we had an injection of um, funds to expand our 
community network. So we've jumped to last year having 63 community perinatal uh, services across the country, which is a fantastic, you know, phenomenal increase in services. With that comes additional uh, work, certainly for the C CCQI team, but the need also to have many more reviewers to make this a meaningful full process. So it's, it's really important that we have as many uh, clinicians and psychiatrists involved in this process. So how, we're grateful to Hannah uh, from the per, uh, Perinatal Quality Network for, for sharing some of these slides so I could share with you in this webinar. And this is uh, one of Hannah's tweets that I uh, uh, saw. Uh, Hannah uh, tweeted the difference between the previous year and actually what was happening this year and what a difference uh, has happened in terms of the ability to do these reviews. But actually, I think uh, there, there's been a really good way to still continue with with the uh, virtual networks. The standards have become much tighter. So these were some of the highlights from last year's uh, um, quality network for the community standards. So we're, we've been able to reduce some of the standards. We've turned some of those uh, standards for psychologists, for example, and parent therapies have been added uh, as a type three standard, which, which isn't a, an, an essential type one, but actually something that would be really good to have. Uh, and, and the other important aspect is that there's been a real increase in the involvement of mums and partners and families in all aspects of care and an, in, an increased service and the uh, increased focus on the use of peer support and having structures in place to support uh, training and supervision of peer support workers. So that's, that's a big change within the network. Uh, so lots of positives from the flexibility of remote reviews, um, also some challenges. But that's okay, you know. We, we like a we like a challenge, but it's a. Uh, uh, I think the main challenge has been around technology. I think one of the greatest things about uh, being a reviewer, being part of this process, is is the ability to work with the patient representatives on the network, who make a, a fantastic contrib contribution to all aspects of the peer review, including leading some aspects of the peer review, um, and that again adds to that focus back on why are we doing these reviews and uh, the importance that we're we're focusing back on our patients and our carers during this it was wonderful to see in last year's network that actually we've stretched some of the uh, work that's happening to include include some uh, uh, artwork so there was an artwork, artwork competition last year and i've just included um, the people who won, the team that won were from the Wakefield uh, services, so a beautiful, beautiful piece of art there, uh, but also from the Beadnell mother and baby unit here, and also from the Brockington mother and baby unit. So as you've heard, you know, there are 27 different networks. Uh, I don't know the other networks so intimately, but I, I certainly know the, the perinatal one and the, and the story that the perinatal Quality Network has been able to weave uh, over all these years. And I really look forward to how it will progress over the, over the next chunk of time. I'm extremely grateful to the CCQI team who, who I know uh, work tirelessly to keep this going. So I'm going to stop there and move on to questions. Hopefully we have time for some questions as well. Uh, yes, we have a few questions. So um, one question for the panelists um, uh, has come from a lot of people. Um, so I'm not going to name anybody specific, but can retired uh, people get involved in reviews? Me to, I'll answer that one. Um, yes, they can. Um, and what we normally say is that um, if somebody's retired and isn't currently in clinical practice, um, they can be involved for up to two years after the point of retirement. Um, but yes, they make a really valuable contribution. Okay, next question again um, from quite a lot of people. Um, is there any evidence that the CQC take the CCQI reviews into account? I can speak from the um, experience within my own, our own service. Um, and um, they did look at the, um, they did look at the accreditation um, and the evidence for it. It was very easy for us to provide evidence to the CQC because we had we had it already for um, in the format that is required for 
the quality network, um, and it was extremely beneficial. Um, in the CQC report, the final report that was published, um, they have used that as evidence for the rating um, that they gave our service of good. And, and also just to add to that, if you go on the CQC website, many of our networks are listed on there as recognised information sources. And that means, as Michelle said, if a service has been reviewed, they'll look at the CCQI report and often many of their reports make reference to the visits that we've done. Yes, and I, and I can add to that, actually. I know that CQC look at a variety of different uh, peer review and accreditation reports. Uh, and I know that when we last had our uh, CQC, we used um, this accreditation report and it was fantastic and and the other bit is that it really gets you know it prepares a team in this doesn't become a, a cqc preparation exercise it means that the team is just used to looking at quality uh, regardless of a cqc arriving so that's the other important point i think for the for the service okay um a question from alex uh, thompson um asking how can we encourage uptake of the peer review networks in the devolved nations and firm up links with the devolved nation inspectorates we're doing quite a bit of work with the um, regional officers based in the devolved nations of the college and the staff there and also the committees there to try and promote the work of the department and i think one thing we're doing at the moment is an exercise just to review our standards to make sure that they um, are really well written to apply across the devolved nations because obviously sometimes there's slightly different language or slightly different terminology and um, so we're doing a lot of work to make sure we get that right and working with um the college teams locally but if anyone's got any um anyone wants to get in touch to think about how we can do that more that would be really appreciated because that's something we're really keen to focus on um and another question um that's come from quite a lot of people uh one including david hall um can, uh, but um, and a variety and a very variation on this question: Can higher trainees become peer reviews, or is it just consultants? You know, how senior and experienced a consultant do you need to be to do a peer review? So generally, in terms of the um, uh, review team, it's normally people who are consultants. But um, I know we have had some trainees go on review teams in the past, kind of in a, almost a supernumerary position, just to kind of um kind of participate in the process and um, which has worked well so if people are interested do get in touch and we can put them in touch with the relevant network to see what the opportunities are there yes and higher trainees can be part of a review process in getting ready for a review yeah. but also being there on the day so it's uh, it's really good at learning in that way they can also attend any of the uh, network events as part of their learning yeah. that's the way they can um, be involved and actually if they're based in a service that's been reviewed it's a really good opportunity to in terms of like some of the stuff they need to do around clinical audit and that kind of stuff it's a great opportunity to get involved in the organization as well as um, attending the events um and there's been a couple of questions about whether or not there is a substance misuse um network and whether any um, services are engaged or taking part in reviews at the moment there isn't we did have some discussions um a few years ago about it and and the way that it works when we're developing a new network is we normally um i guess test the waters to see if there's services that would be interested in participating and at that point it didn't seem like it was something that would take off and um, so we didn't pursue it at that time but as i say we're constantly adding to the list and adding one or two um new networks every year so um if that interest was there that would be something we'd be definitely interested in and I think we've got time for one more question, uh, which is, um, what is the difference between a peer review and accreditation? It's a good question. Um, so there's peer review involved in accreditation, but um, some of our visits that we offer are not accreditation and some are, and essentially um, they all use a very similar methodology, but some of them are more developmental. So if a team is maybe at a point where they don't think they're ready to work towards accreditation or they don't think they're at the right standard. They can still have a visit and still have a peer review process, but um, it wouldn't result in a decision about whether the service became accredited or not. If they want to go for that, it's a slightly different process, but it still uses very similar principles around peer review. Um, and if you want to be a reviewer, you can be a reviewer for both processes. Um, there's just sometimes slightly more additional training if you want to be an accreditation reviewer. 
Uh, that's it from the questions. Thanks, Sarah. That's brilliant. And Peter, can I just ask you, is it perhaps just one more question um, um, to finish with? If somebody is interested in signing up to be a reviewer, and we've heard that 85% uh, after Michelle's talk, and I'm hoping that might have nudged up even higher, what, what do people do? Um, if you go on to the chat function, Harriet has been sharing a link to a page on the college website where you can actually register your input uh, interest so you can put in your details, say what type of service you work in, and there's a question just about any previous experience you've had of doing something similar. Um, and if you send that in, we'll distribute it to the relevant teams within the department and we'll be in touch um, to see um, how we can take that forward. So please do get in touch. And also, if you if you have any problems with that page or anything, my email address was on my slides as well. So do just get in touch with us directly or via Twitter. Um, but the college website link that Carrier shared is probably the best way to register interest if you'd like to. That's brilliant. I think on that, we've hit uh, uh, five o'clock, haven't we, on the dot? So can I say a huge thank you to Peter from the CCQI team, to Vishal for your expertise in running these uh, over many, many years. Uh, also to the CCQI team who do all of this work uh, for our 27 networks and uh, Catherine and the team who've helped to uh, get this webinar ready for you today. So thanks very much, everybody. Take care and be safe. Thank you, Julie.